Welcome to the Frontier AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming today. We have a jam-packed session planned, and I think Dr. Spock is familiar to all of you. So without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to David. Great. Thank you, Brian. Well, several times in our sessions, the issues of HIV co-receptor tropism has come up. So what I'm going to talk today about is testing for HIV co-receptor tropism. And specifically what I'd like to accomplish in this is to initially discuss the role of co-receptor tropism in HIV cell entry. Then I'll move into the specific regions of HIV that determine the co-receptor tropism. Then we'll move on to the practical applications of this, which are the CCR5 antagonists, which now we only have one, Maraviroc. And then I'll finish by talking about a little bit more of the conceptually complicated issue is the co-receptor tropism assays, and now we have two different types, a phenotype and genotype, that are available. So to begin with, the role of tropism in HIV cell entry is critical. If we take a bird's eye view at what HIV does when it encounters a cell, it encounters CD4 receptors and co-receptors, and these are host receptors on the cell. If we zoom in on this a little bit, we can see that there are two major co-receptors that are utilized by the virus, and these are known as the CCR5 receptor or the CXCR4 receptor. The virus, first off, binds to the CD4 receptor, then the second step in the entry is the binding to one of these major co-receptors. Now, depending on what strain of HIV you have, you can enter one of two pathways, essentially. This is showing you a R5 virus, which is essentially a virus that preferentially goes through the CCR5 receptor pathway. This is called CCR5 tropic HIV. And think of this conceptually as, for example, a right-handed virus. Now, if you have CXCR4 tropic virus or X4 virus, this is a virus that goes through the CXCR4 receptor. Think of this conceptually as a left-handed virus. You can also have virus that enters either one of these receptors. You can have virus that can go either through the CCR5 or the CXCR4. These are called dual tropic HIV. Conceptually, think of this as a ambidextrous virus. Last, what you can have is a mixture of viruses. This is showing you a mixture of R5 and X4 virus. We call this mixed tropic. And think of this as a mixture of right-handed and left-handed viruses. Now, just to summarize then, they're really these major types of viral strains that we talk about. We talk about R5 virus, X4 virus, dual tropic virus, or mixed tropic virus. Now, when someone is first infected with HIV, they're almost always infected with R5 virus. If you look at this graphic, this is showing you the percentage of R5 virus in people based on their CD4 count. So in other words, the percentage of people that have pure R5 virus. So in other words, the percentage of people where Maraviroc would work. And this is showing you that above a CD4 count of 500, most people have R5 tropic virus, pure R5 virus. As you move on with more advanced HIV and you move to CD4 count under 50, you can see this drops off significantly. You have a much greater chance of individuals having X4, dual, or mixed virus as you move down to a lower CD4 count range. Now, just to summarize in some of the properties, the R5 tropic virus is predominantly what we see in transmitted HIV. It's predominantly and very common in early stage HIV. X4 tropic virus is what you see more often in individuals with late stage HIV disease. And interestingly, X4 virus has the ability to accelerate the progression of HIV, and it's something that we preferentially hope patients do not develop, and we, we try to avoid shunting them down the X4 tropic pathway. Now, it's important to understand conceptually what regions of the virus determines tropism. I think a lot of people get this confused, and they think it's something on the cell that's determining the tropism. It's actually the virus that's determining these different strains. So let's step back and look at this. So looking at the virus again, it really has a choice whether or not it goes down the CCR5 pathway or the CXCR4 pathway. And the part of the virus that plays the critical role is the outer knob of the virus called the HIV envelope. 
If we blow this up and look at it even closer, we can see that the HIV envelope is a trimer that's made up of two major components, the so-called GP41 segment and the GP120 segment. The GP120 is the very outermost knob of the virus. Specifically, the V3 region shown on the right is the area of the GP120 that determines the viral tropism. If we actually look at this V3 region, we can see it in the context of an overall polypeptide of the GP120. Up in your upper right, you can see the V3 region is a loop, and it's made up of only about 35 amino acids. Okay, now let's look at the practical issues of how can we inhibit the virus from going through this CCR5 co-receptor. CCR5 antagonist, in this example is showing you Maravroc, which is the only commercially available CCR5 antagonist, block the viral entry through the CCR5 pathway if you have exclusive pure R5 HIV. What actually happens is Maravroc binds to the co-receptor, it causes a conformational change, and it effectively blocks the adequate binding of the R5 virus to the co-receptor. Now, if you have a smattering or a lot of X4 virus that's present in the patient, you can see that Maravroc will fail to block HIV cell entry if the individual has X4 virus that's circulating. You can also see if the individual has dual tropic virus, which conceptually, again, is like your ambidextrous virus, you will fail to block the entry of the virus with dual tropic HIV. Hence, it becomes very important before you start and you try and use a drug to actually antagonize the co-receptor, you need to know that you are going to have an effective outcome. And this is why we do the so-called HIV co-receptor tropism testing. Now, what you can get with co-receptor tropism testing is really one of three results. The test is gonna come back and tell you you either have R5 virus, you have X4 virus, or you actually have dual or mixed tropic virus. And this is the, the outcome of the test. And what we're hoping to find is pure R5 virus. That's the holy grail for what you want to be able to use a CCR5 antagonist. You're looking for pure R5 virus and no evidence of X4 virus, dual, or mixed tropic virus. Now, there are now two different types of co-receptor tropism testing. There's a phenotype HIV co-receptor tropism assay. There's what we call a trophile assay, a standard trophile assay, and then a trophile DNA. Trophile DNA is really applied when you have patients with very low level viremia or undetectable viral loads. These are both offered by Monogram Biosciences. More recently, there's been the application of a genotype that's a tropism test, and the particular genotype test that's offered does an initial standard genotype, and if that test is negative, it moves on to what we call an ultra-deep sequencing. This is offered by Quest Laboratories. Now let me walk you through what happens with the tropism assay, because it's a bit uh, confusing just in terms of the level of detail for what has to happen. So basically, on your left, you take a plasma sample of HIV from your, from your patient. The virus is actually isolated out from this sample, they then dissolve the virus and isolate out the viral RNA from, the, from this sample. Then you do reverse transcription to isolate out viral DNA. You amplify the DNA to get your specific genes that you're looking for. And the one that we're interested in is the HIV envelope gene. So what they do in this test is once you've isolated out and amplified the envelope gene, you combine it with a laboratory vector and you insert this envelope gene into the vector. And then you're, at that point, able to move on and, and, and perform the tropism assay. So you've got on your right, up at the top, you've got the envelope that's from the patient's sample. And this, again, is gonna be the area of the virus that we're interested in that determines tropism. You then combine that with, on your left, a laboratory HIV expression vector. The yellow indicates a luciferase gene that is there that will light up when it's activated inside the cell. That's the marker at the end of this test. So you combine the envelope gene, the expression vector, and they create pseudoviruses that are made in this HEC293 cell line. The pseudoviruses are called pseudoviruses because they're not able to replicate. They're called replication defective viruses. 
What you do then is you incubate these pseudoviruses in several cell lines. You incubate them in the, the targets that we're interested in. You genetically engineer these cells so they have pure CCR5 receptors on their surface or they have pure CXCR4 receptors on the surface. And then you incubate these viruses in. An example that I'm showing here is your pseudoviruses or R5 virus from the patient and the luciferase gene lights up once the virus enters the cell and starts to replicate inside of the cell. It can't go on and infect other cells. You then have the cell lit up, and this is a positive test for R5 virus. Analogously, you could have the same thing if you had X4 virus. That cell below would light up. Now, the trophile tropism assay requires a viral load of at least 1,000 copies per mil. This takes at least two weeks to perform. Some places can turn it around a little quicker, but in general, it's about two weeks to perform. And importantly, it has a sensitivity of 100% for detecting CXCR4 utilizing clones. This is uh, X4 virus. If the clone makes up at least 0.3 of the virus population. So that means if you've got a tiny bit of X4 virus around, this tropism assay is going to pick it up. It's a very sensitive test. Now, one point of confusion is the standard trophile co-receptor tropism assay, which is shown on your left, which I just went through, takes a plasma sample of the virus and amplifies up from there. On the right, the example is a trophile DNA. And this is the test that we use if a patient has an undetectable viral load or viral load less than 1,000. And what this test does in particular, it doesn't isolate out direct circulating virus in the plasma. It takes out cells lyses the cells, and as you can see here then, the virus that's integrated into the cells, the so-called proviral DNA, can then be amplified out, and then you can get the envelope gene amplified. Now you can do the standard type of test that I just went through in terms of the tropism assay. So conceptually then, the trophile assay is twofold. You can get a standard plasma sample, or you can actually use cellular fractions to, to isolate out and amplify proviral DNA. Now, what about a genotype test? As I discussed, it's the V3 region of the GP120 where the money is in terms of the actual determinants of tropism. So the genetic test is simply an amplification of the V3 region of the GP120. And again, this is going to, the polypeptide is only going to be about 35 amino acids long. Now, the test that's run by Quest, what they do <clears throat> is they do standard, what we call conventional bulk sequencing uh, genotype. So if you have a lot of X4 virus around, as shown in this example, if there's more than 20% of the circulating strains or X4 virus, you will easily detect it and the test will be positive. However, if the test is actually negative when you do your initial screening, then you won't detect this with the conventional sequencing. So this example I'm showing you, there's only a very small percentage of X4 virus that's circulating. With this standard assay, it will only detect out and it'll read out as positive for R5. So what this particular company does is if you get an initial negative test, they say, we need to take this a step further and make sure there's no small amount a virus that's around that's X4, so they perform then what's called ultra deep sequencing, which detects all the way down to, to less than 1% of the circulating strain. So for example, if this was a patient who had only a tiny amount of X4 virus circulating around, you would now then detect it with the ultra, ultra deep sequencing as shown here. So how are these tests actually being used and what's recommended in the DHHS guidelines? So first of all, the first recommendation is if you are thinking about using Maraviroc, you should perform a tropism assay. You should never ba basically fly blind here and just use Maraviroc without knowing that you have pure R5 virus circulating in your patient. The second recommendation is, is that it's also recommended to do a tropism assay if a patient is on Maraviroc and they're failing Mar Maraviroc because one of the reasons they could be failing is that you're now shunting them down an X4 pathway and they've emerged with predominant X4 virus. The third recommendation is a phenotype is preferred over the genotype. The genotype is a little easier test to perform, 
but the phenotype has more, more, I think, fidelity, more sensitivity, and we have more experience with it. And the last is, there is a genotype that is now offered, as I mentioned, and it can be considered as an alternative. So in summary then, I think there are these four major key points. First of all, as I've reviewed, HIV depends on these co-receptors to enter cells. The second point is, it's the V3 region of the HIV outermost envelope the GP120 segment that's the primary tropism determinant. The third is use of the CCR5 inhibitors clinically requires that you identify the patient has pure R5 virus that's circulating. And the last is if you are performing tropism assays, currently the phenotypic assays are preferred for tropism testing.